firmly standing as the cultural vanguard of West Java, Indonesia, nourishing the intellectual life of the nation, working for the benefit of the global world. This is Universitas Pajajaran. Inspired by the vision of the Asia-Africa Conference attended by representatives of 24 countries, the establishment of the university was the realization of the vision of the cultural figures of West Java to found an institution of higher learning in the cosmopolitan city to educate and set forth to society dedicated and qualified individuals. Today, UNPAD has broadened its wings to encompass various disciplines and multidisciplinary academic endeavors through the efforts of 16 faculties and one postgraduate school. To achieve its mission to build the capacity to adapt and innovate in the face of the rapid development of science and technology at the international level, UNPAD is determined to become the center of research and innovation for the good of the nation and the world by continuously nourishing research and developing technology to create innovations in various disciplines. Currently, 36,000 students are registered at UNPAD and more than 200 international students are registered in different programs, degree and non-degree. As an effort to constantly improve the quality of education, Universitas Pajajaran is supported by approximately 2,100 professional faculty members with reputable qualifications. To achieve the goals of its mission, UNPAD has also established notable research centers which demonstrate serious commitment to and focus on achievements in a number of strategic fields such as the Center for Sustainable Development Goal Studies, the Center for Environmental and Sustainability Sciences, the Academic Health System, the Center for the Digitalization and Development of Sundanese Culture, the Center for Innovation and Pharmaceutical Services, the Center for Nanotechnology and Graphene Research, to name a few. Equipped with a central science laboratory network and a science and technology complex in the Center for the Development of Science and Technology on the main campus, Universitas Pajajaran has risen in its role as a leader in higher learning geared towards innovation. UNPAD also fosters collaboration with other institutions involving all stakeholders. Universitas Pajajaran commits in providing benefit and service for the good of humanity and the preservation of the environment. This is a great enterprise which cannot be done alone. UNPAD believes that in the spirit of collaboration, this vision may be achieved. We invite you who have the same vision a good intention to care for human life and the environment all over the world, to work with us, build collaborations, create a better world together. Universitas Pajajaran grew out of the community and has made it its duty to give back not only in the form of the dissemination of knowledge and information, but also through socially responsible activities such as student fieldwork, community outreach programs, and action research seeking to make direct impact on the community. With its feet firmly grounded in the local communities and environment, UNPAD is also making great efforts to take steps towards internationalization. It offers special programs for international students to maintain its global network and make its strategic and reputable place on the world map of higher education. As a site for the personal development of young minds and bodies, UNPAD supports a wide variety of student activities.
Unpad also provides students with libraries with an extensive collection of books, periodicals, and study materials, comfortable dormitories, health and fitness services, free on-campus transportation, and other supporting facilities which Unpad continuously upgrades and improves. While being committed internationally recognized quality research, UNPAD maintains also its dedication in preserving traditional cultures as the compass for all of UNPAD's activities on and off campus. As of now, UNPAD have set forth unto society 200,000 graduates in various fields of work, including strategic government sectors and crucial multinational industries. works for the good of society, bringing innovations and sincere contributions to humanity. Universitas Pajajaran, the pride of West Java, working for the benefit of the global world. Greetings from Transcendent Study 21, Massive Open Online Course in Cleft Lip and Palette, held by the Faculty of Dentistry Universitas Payujaran, collaborating with Smeltrain and Indonesian Cleft Center, has been going on for a few weeks. My name is Josephine Mel, <laughs> Indonesia, and I will be the Master of Ceremony of today's live discussion. I see that we came from different countries, so I think it is appropriate to say good morning, good afternoon, and good evening to everyone here. Also, greetings to our expert today, Dr. Abdul Saleh Muhammad from Abnu Aminu Kaino Teaching Hospital, Grassroots Mal Initiative, Nigeria. Thank you for being here, Doc. Uh, we are so honored by your presence here. How are you, Doctor? Okay, I think uh, Dr. Abdul Salem in a good condition. Okay, and then I would like to greet to all participants. Thank you for participating in this course and thank you for attending this live discussion session. And we also have our moderator today, Dr. Anglin Rafisa. She is one of my lecturers in the Faculty of Dentistry, Universitas Payajaran. How do you feel, Doctor? Good, thank you, Josephine. Okay, thank you very much, Doctor. So first of all, I would like to explain about this live discussion. So it will be separated into two sessions. In the first session, the expert will be answering the questions that have been filled out by the participants on the MOOC platform. The questions will be presented on the screen. And the participants have already watched the lecture video about the related topic, which is cleft nutrition. So they have seen your lecture, Doctor. So even though I think not everyone can make it into this live discussion, but don't worry, I'm sure that all other 300 participants that have registered for our course have watched your lecture video as well, and they will watch the recorded live discussion session. Next, in the second session, the participants will have the opportunity to ask the questions directly to the speaker through the Zoom chat, and they will write down the questions, their name, and where they are coming from or the participant can also unmute, unmute their microphone and ask directly to the expert in the second session. So now I would like to give the spotlight to our moderator, Dr. Amun Rafisa and Dr. Abdul Salam Muhammad as our speaker. Dr. Angun, you may start the first session and lead today's live discussion session. Thank you so much. Now we are moving on to the first session. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Joseph Inja. Uh, Dr. Abdul Salam, how are you today? Well, good morning. I'm doing fine. Okay. Thank you for coming today to into our live discussion. In this first session, I will read the question from the participants that have been submitted in the OMOC live unpad. Uh, before we start, uh, do you have anything to say or mention to the participant, Dr. Abdul Salam? Well, I will first of all thank your university for giving me this opportunity to participate in this question and answer session. Uh, I feel honored. Uh, and uh, it's a rare privilege given to me. I thank you all. Okay, Doctor. Uh, I think we can start the first session now. Uh, yes. The committee? 
please uh, share the questions. Okay, this is the first question, and it was from uh, Gretanza Hendra, Monica. And the question is, what is the most effective technique for burping a baby? But, um, the most effective way of burping a baby after breastfeeding, especially babies with cleft um, lip or palates, is to actually hold the baby straight on the mother's chest. The baby should be erect. And um, uh, with, um, uh, yes, exactly. The baby being held erect and um, his, back, his back is being massaged by the mother. That will actually help in the air being swallowed by the baby to be what? To be what? To be brought out uh, by the baby so that um, uh, uh, unnecessary abdominal distension that is encountered in those kind of babies uh, can be avoided. So the best way is to hold the baby erect on the mother's chest with his face facing back or uh, on the mother's um, shoulder and massaging his back. That will effectively help in uh, bringing out um, the swallowed air in the baby. Uh, I think burping on a baby is very important, uh, even though in, in a cleft uh, patient also, like Dr. Abdusalam? Yes. Yes, uh, okay. For the second... Mm. Mm. Because okay, one of the major problem is actually swallowing air, which we call aerophagia. That's swallowing air because of the word of the cleft they have. And that can actually interfere with effective feeding in the baby. And that can also uh, be associated with um, unnecessary abdominal distension, which can make mm -hmm. the baby to regurgitate the feed and possibly have what we call nasal regurgitation or even aspirate the feet. Okay, thank you very much, doctor. Uh, for the second question, please. Okay, it's from Maulida from Universitas Pajajaran. It was said in the lecture that breastfeeding could decrease the risk of ear infection. If the baby cannot be breastfed, how do we prevent the ear infection? Please, doctor. Uh, the reason why we said breastfeeding help in preventing ear infection is not just in the technique of feeding, but is in what? In the immunoglobulin, the antibodies contained in the mother, which actually help in preventing the baby uh, from contracting what we call um, uh, respiratory tract infections and uh, also the uh, otitis media, which is ear infection. But there's another way, breastfeeding, if the baby is being breastfed, uh, being held um, uh, erect, and um, uh, being breastfed with the nipple of the mother's breast being away from the cleft, that helps the breast milk in going down straight into the baby's throat and get swallowed. Uh, unlike in other situations whereby babies are being breastfed while lying down or being um, lying oblique, and that can actually create unnecessary spillage of the breast milk from the pharynx into the ear, into the ostrichian tube. And that can bring about what we call um, recurrent, uh, uh, respiratory, um, um, recurrent um, otitis media or ear infection. So if the baby is, even if the baby is not being breastfed, the best way is if, if the baby is being breastfed or is being fed with um, uh, express breast milk or uh, what we call breast milk substitute, if it is being prepared, either being it in the uh, feeding bottle, the baby can be held erect and then the nipple of the bottle being um, put away from the cleft in such a way that um, uh, there will not be spillage of the milk uh, or the breast milk substitute into the baby's um, uh, ostetrian tube and now bring low lead to uh, otitis media or recurrent AI infections. Uh what about if uh, a baby use, uh, you know that there are uh, bottles that call the orthognatic bottles, uh, Dr. Abdul Salam, is that increasing the ear infection also? Or you just uh, for the uh, can you, can uh, conservative uh, bottle? Well, feeding bottle. Yes, uh, the bottle. Yeah, I know I've, I've read about this that uh, Babies that do not breastfed uh, are uh, really uh, have a high risk of ear infection because of the, uh, they use uh, the conservative bottle. But, if, but what if they use uh, a prognatic bottle, the new, the new bottle that have uh, different nipples and have very likely with uh, uh, the mother breast? Yes. Uh, using conservative bottle depends on actually on the type of cleft that the baby is having. If it's just a baby that is having the cleft of the soft palate, the conventional um, uh, feeding bottle can be used. But in a situation whereby a baby has a um, uh, cleft palate, definitely conservative uh, conventional um, uh, feeding bottle cannot be used because it will not serve the purpose. In fact, it will cause more harm than good. 
So in that way, using the what we call the Habermas feeder uh, would be much more effective. The Habermas feeder has some uh, uh, nipple that is soft, that is squeezable, that can be manipulated by the baby. So I think I'm uh, using conservative bottle or conventional bottle feeding bottle is not actually advised in all types of cleft. So also baby having um, uh, uh, both cleft lip and palate. You cannot use a conventional feeding bottle in feeding those kind of kids because actually it will bring about what aspiration or even nasal regurgitation and also the otitis media that we are talking about. So there's a, there are special feeding bottles that can be employed in this kind of babies. But if a baby has just mere cleft, uh, uh, cleft of the soft palate or has just some uh, uh, cleft lip, a uh, feeding bottle can be used quite all right, the conventional feeding bottle. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Doctor, for the very clear uh, answer. Okay, for the third question, please. It's from Filza. Uh, she said that what kind of infection that usually occur from unclean utensil for the baby besides diarrhea? Please, Doctor. Yes, there are other infections, actually, um, uh, not just diarrhea, because um, uh, if we even start from the diarrhea, that can uh, progress to develop into what we call uh, sepsis or septicemia in the baby. And that can mean general infection with the microorganism in the baby's bloodstream or system, multiplying and manifesting with signs and symptoms of infection. So it's not just diarrhea that can actually occur. Another thing that can occur is the uh, possibility of if the uh, the utensil that is being um, used in feeding the baby is not um, uh, is not um, uh, is not clean. Uh, in the process, the baby is being fed with contaminated food, and that contaminated food also, if the baby now aspirate or regurgitate that feed, baby can aspirate the feed, the contaminated feed would go straight into the baby's lungs, and that can also risk to what we call pneumonia or chest infections. So it's not um, it's not just diarrhea that is actually being uh, observed in unclean utensils that are being fed, used in feeding them. Uh, babies with cleft lip or palate. So sterilizing the utensils of the baby is very important, right, doctor? Very, very important, very, very important indeed. At least the mother needs to actually uh, uh, sterilize the utensils for at least 10 minutes. I think in my lecture, I specifically said for, for a period of 10 minutes. Okay. It's very clear there. Yeah, 10 minutes, right, doctor. Okay. Uh, the next question, please. Uh, it's from Rashid Abdul Aziz from Universitas Pajajaran. How common is stunting occur in cleft or infants or toddler? If a child were suffered from stunting between the age of six to 24 months, which is the ideal time of cleft surgeries, how is the treatment plans being implemented? Will the catch-up growth intervention affect the timing of surgeries and cause further problems, especially in terms of the surgical outcomes? Please, Dr. Yes, feeding, I, feeding is very important I mean, in all infants, more so including the uh, babies with, or infants with cleft lip or palate. Um, because why I said so, nutrition, any malnutrition that occurs within the first 1,000 days of the life of the baby or the infant can actually have what we call detrimental or even irreversible effect, especially on the baby's brain. Because that, that's, that, 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 within that period, that's when they, about 80 to 90% of the baby's brain growth is actually what achieved. So if there is malnutrition there, that can actually lead to what lead to stunting uh, subsequently or underweight or any of the uh, underweight uh, stunting or even um, uh, being wasted. Now, you see avoidance of feeding in this kind of babies can be started right from birth when the mothers are being taught how to feed these babies. And that breastfeeding or whatever form of feeding with the breast milk or be it breast milk substitute can be carried up to the age of um, uh, six months when the complementary feeding is supposed to be what started together with continuation of the breastfeeding uh, up to the age of two years. But in children that are already stunted, probably because the parents are not being informed or educated on how to feed these babies or for other reasons, and the baby gets stunted, uh, stunting actually is not 100% reversible, but can be achieved also. Uh, but um, uh, it can be, it can be uh, the, the effect can be, I can say, lessened by feeding baby with adequate complementary feeding, especially uh, from that age of two years, uh, good nutritional um, uh, components or uh, constituents or nutrients can be provided to the child and the mother's also been taught. Uh, the reason why it is not universal to say, okay, this baby will now achieve um, uh, what it, um, uh, 
uh, patch of growth like other babies. It depends on the setting, it depends on the locality, and it depends also on the economic status of the parents. Because some parents, poverty, actually ignorance and disease, they are linked. So in a situation whereby the parents are poor, especially in our own developing countries like Nigeria here, you find out even the family, what to eat is a problem, not to talk of what to give to the baby. So in that setting, you have to now observe and find out what food that is locally available that can now help this baby in achieving the required growth and development to actually help in him catching up, the, uh, catching up what he has actually not achieved before. So those are some of the factors that actually uh, affect um, the nutritional um, uh, rehabilitation of this kind of um, children that we have. Um, another thing is to also, apart from what is locally available, um, some supporting group, because just like it clipped um, this mile train that um, uh, uh, we are in, in our own setting here, it actually empower parents, give them some of the complementary feeding and even the feeding of the grown up children free. And it's also help in now um, reaching out to the community, in mobilizing the community and also educating the community on how to actually improve the diet of uh, cleft lip and palate. Not just the diet, but also the mode of feeding, the technique of feeding is very important. They have to be taught. Because even if you give somebody uh, a balanced diet that he should give to a stunted child, if he doesn't know how to give it, it's actually going to be a problem because that uh, the whole aim of, um, of, giving the of giving that feeding will not be achieved. So I think it depends. There is need, even if the child is stunted, those stunting cannot be 100% reversible, as I said earlier, but um, something can be done to actually listen, lessen the effect eh, or improve the growth and development of the child based on what is locally available or affordable, feasible, uh, uh, safe and sustainable to the parents. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Abu Salam. Uh, the next question, please. It's from Mutiara uh, from uh, Universitas Pajajaran. In cleft repair, the condition of the infants should fulfill the criteria of rule of tense, which one of them is the infant should weigh at least 10 pounds. Have you ever met a case where the infant weighed less than 10 pounds at the time of surgery? If this happens, is it okay to postpone the time of the primary surgery and what impact would occur if we did postpone it? Please, doctor. Yeah, quite all right. There is that rule of 10. Uh, at least the baby should be 10 pounds. But um, uh, I think I have ever come across a baby that was less than 10 pounds. But because of the age of the baby, uh, I think um, the surgeon, I will say, adventured into doing the surgery. Uh, it, was, it was successful, I would say. But it is a risky situation because if the infant that is going for surgery is not nutritionally well, uh, is not fed. Yeah, the nutrition actually affects immunity. And uh, it also affects um, uh, the way the baby is going to respond to, to the wound healing after the surgery. So I don't think it advisable. I think we should still stick to the rule of 10 in doing the surgery of this baby. We have to make sure that they have adequate weight, they have adequate hemoglobin in them, and they have reached the adequate um, uh, period when they are fit for this surgery to avoid complications, either being pre-op pre complications or post-op complications, especially things that have to do with the immunity, things that have to do with um, healing uh, and uh, other things that may actually arise. Uh, okay, Dr. Abu Salam, the next question. Uh, I think all the questions that have been submitted in the MOOC Life One Pad have all been answered. Right, committee? Okay. Um, excuse me, Dr. Angun. So we have another question here, and the committee will have help to move the question from the Zoom chat to the presented screen. So, okay. Okay, we have another question here, Dr. Abdesalam. Yes. Okay, can I go ahead? Okay, yes, you may. Okay, well, can you? Just read the question aloud so that we can. Okay, it's from Farsha. 
what is the indication of nasogastric feeding application in class children? Does nasogastric feeding are possible to be an option to ease the challenges of feeding practices in class children? so the children could reach optimal weight right before the surgery without much difficulties. Please, Doctor. Yeah, thank you very much for this question. Um, it's a very interesting question, actually. Indications for nasogastric feeding um, can be, let me say one, in a situation where we have um, uh, a baby that is um, unable to suck directly or to tolerate oral feeding for one reason or the other, uh, that child or that infant should be fed using the nasogastric fee, uh, tube. Uh, another indication is a situation whereby uh, the baby is a premature baby and uh, has poor sucking reflex, cannot suck, there is a hypotonic, and if we rely on his sucking ability, he will not suckle what will be enough for him. And, and that's also another indication for uh, using nasogastric tube feeding. Now, in situation whereby infants have had surgery, and um, uh, they, cannot, um, they cannot be breastfed directly. And that's also another indication for, giving the, uh, for feeding the child using nasogastric, feed, uh, nasogastric tube. But let me also say that nasogastric tube feeding is another technique or alternative technique for feeding uh, uh, the babies with cleft lip and, uh, and uh, palate, especially babies with cleft palate. So um, it can be used in situation whereby uh, the mother is either not cooperating or does not know uh, what to do and has been taught on that, um, uh, on that issue. And yet the outcome uh, or the results that have been obtained probably in the weight gain of that child, they are not impressive or they are not quite um, uh, something that is to appreciate. So that child can be placed on nasogastric feeding to enhance uh, uh, proper weight gain um, uh, while the child is also being uh, are trained on how to accept oral feeding because the child cannot be on a um, nasogastric tube forever. As the child is nas on nasogastric tube feeding, now from time to time, occasional oral feeding can also be tried to train the child in, uh, uh, in trying to feed him. Now in a situation whereby probably the child may be wean off the nasogastric tube feeding. So these are some of the indications I have mentioned. A situation whereby a baby cannot um, uh, suckle directly because either baby is sick or has had um, surgery, or the baby is a premature baby, or there is no appreciable um, weight gain uh, when the baby is being fed orally using either bottle feeding or using, uh, being breast, using breastfeeding. And that child can also be, be placed on um, nasogastric tube feeding to improve um, the outcome of the weight gain. Okay, thank you very much, doctor. I think we here have another question in the chat. Okay, right. Thank you, Kobiti. It's from Abdullah Musa Saad from College of Health and Technology, Kano Dental Department, Nigeria. And the question is, if a cleft patient did not breastfeed, what is the best food is recommended to him and how to fat the baby? Please, doctor. Yes, thank you. For a baby that has not um, breastfed or is unable to breastfeed, because the WHO recommendation is for a baby, every baby that is born, be it a normal baby or infant with the cleft lip or palate, is to be breastfed from the day of delivery up to the age of six months. Now, in a situation whereby a baby with cleft is unable to feed for one reason or the other, now the mother can be encouraged to express the breast milk. Now, if the mother expresses and um, the breast milk, we can use, depending on the type of cleft that the Child is having. We can use artificial um, um, feeding bottles to actually put the milk inside and now be feeding the baby with. Now, and the feeding, the pattern of feeding is that the baby should be fed every two hours, so that in 24 hours, at least the baby would have fed 12 times. Okay? Now, that is what is required. But in a situation too, whereby the mother is unable to produce breast milk, that's when we now opt for what we call breast milk substitute. Now, in opting for that breast milk substitute, somebody has to be very careful. Now, you have to look at the setting of the parent. There's what we call AFAS in prescribing breast milk substitute. The A, this, the acronym for AFAS is that the A stands for affordability. Then the F stands for feasibility, if it is feasible. Now, the A, is it accessible? Then the S, is it sustainable? The another S, is it safe? 
So you see, before you go ahead and recommend this, you must be, we must make sure that yes, this is something that can be afforded by the parent and is feasible, is accessible, is sustainable and is safe. Now in a situation whereby you go and prescribe breast milk substitute to a mother who is herself poor, cannot afford that breast milk substitute, is as if you have not done anything to the baby. And the mother will go back and be given whatever is available to her uh, in her environment. So breast milk substitutes is another thing that can be prescribed in a situation whereby uh, uh, the baby has not breastfed or is not breastfeeding. Taking into consideration what I've mentioned before, these conditions of affordability, feasibility, accessibility, sustainability, and safety. Thank you very much, uh, doctor, for the clear answer. Uh, we have another question. Yes. It's from uh, Andrew Lauren from Universitas Pajajaran. Have you ever found the cleft patient with allergic to most of the foods and very difficult to be fat? Are there only any solu are there any solutions for that kind of cleft patients? Thank you. Please. Yes. Um... I will say I have not come across a patient with cleft lip or palate that has what we call milk allergy or uh, yes, in the process of, um, uh, of feeding. Uh, I think I have, I encountered this problem in normal babies. I had about three babies uh, that actually had this uh, milk allergy and sometimes I think one of them had uh, what we call uh, 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 lactose intolerance. Um, those are the kind of baby that will have to feed a lactose-free milk if it is available, or soya bees uh, kind of uh, milk. But um, uh, if the parents too can afford, there are commercial formulas or there are breast milk substitute formulae that are actually meant specifically uh, for, 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 for babies that are allergic to uh, milk, or either they have protein allergy or they have the milk allergy or they are lactose intolerant. Uh, that can be actually found. And these babies, that I saw the normal babies in court that I'm talking about, uh, we were able, because the parents were well-to-do, they were able to secure a uh, breast milk substitute, which is free of um, uh, uh, lactose. And uh, the one that has what we call um, uh, is it, um, um, low, low protein, a kind of that will not stimulate any allergic reaction. They were able to get it from Dubai, one from Saudi Arabia. So you see, it's not something that is very easy because in Nigeria, they couldn't actually get it. So they have to travel all the way from Nigeria to Dubai and Saudi Arabia to actually be able to get these breast milk substitutes. And now consider a situation whereby if the, the parents are poor, uh, this is not something that is easily achievable, but they can also opt uh, for locally available um, uh, lactose-free feeds, especially those that are soya beans and bees that can actually help in trying to tackle the problems of the medical allergy. So uh, there are no uh, breastfed substitutes that are really for lactose intolerance baby that are available. Uh, is that easy, achievable, and available outside there, Dr. Abdul Salam? Yeah, in our own setting, I would say that based on that, because this thing, what I'm saying, occurred almost some uh, two months ago. It's not something that happened um, uh, many years or months. So we source, we actually looked for locally available. Uh, lactose-free milk, uh, but we couldn't get it. I don't know if now, uh, because uh, it's based on demand, if the customers are demanding for something, then those that are selling the product may actually be looking for it to stock for potential buyers. Mm -hmm. But as at then, we were not able to get um, the lactose-free uh, formula. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Abdusala. I think all the questions have been answered answered and uh, before we end this live discussion do you have anything else to say or mention to the participants or uh, to the committee well um i will i will i will express my sincere gratitude and appreciation uh, for giving me this opportunity to be on this uh, question and answer session and i would also like to stress to the participants that they should strive hard in their quest for knowledge. Uh, knowledge is a greater weapon that somebody can be armed with and uh, you can fit in anywhere you go globally. Uh, especially, and I will say also, 
issue of nutrition in cleft uh, palates and uh, lips is very, very challenging. Uh, it's one of the fundamental problems being faced by parents of um, patients with cleft lip or palate, apart from the psychological trauma that they first encounter. The second thing is how to feed the baby. And not only how to feed the baby, because these babies are having deformities. And um, in some societies, they have been looked at as, uh, like uh, something, the parents have committed something wrong, have done something wrong. So they feel guilty, the parents themselves. So it takes time to now counsel these parents and even to accept the fact that, yes, this is something that is correctable. Definitely is correctable, going by the smile train um, uh, participation and uh, achievement globally is something that is correctable, but it sometimes it takes time to counsel and convince these parents. And especially in our setting here in Africa, parents still have what we call mis and misperceptions about this cleft and uh, cleft lip and palate. Sometimes they feel, okay, these parents have done something wrong in the society. That's why God is giving him this kind of child. Or, and then you start blaming one another. Uh, the husband will now blame the wife, the wife will now be blaming the husband, and then the family members will come in, and if care is not taken, you see that what is what you call what uh, family breakage or home breakage, okay? Now, there was a situation whereby immediately the mother delivered a cleft patient. The husband sent her away from, her, from his house, and that lady is up till now in her father's house just because she delivered a cleft patient for him, not knowing that it's not her fault. So it takes time is not something that is really easy, apart from other added economic problems that they may face. Because if a situation whereby a mother is faced with psychological trauma uh, because of the delivery of a patient with cleft, definitely breast milk will not come. Whatever you give to that mother, breast milk will not come because she is not psychologically stable. Because breast milk is a, is a function of also a brain stability or psychological stability of the mother. So you can imagine that. And then apart from that, that patient that is now unable to produce breast milk because of psychological trauma is also very poor. So cannot afford breast milk substitute. So now the child is now left at the mercy of probably good Samaritans who can now come along. And in a situation whereby those good Samaritans are not available, are not forthcoming, uh, the baby actually end up starting with malnutrition right from the way to go, right, right from day one. These are some of the problems. And then recurrent infections, because this is not someone that is nutritionally balanced, is not well nourished. So infections, recurrent infections, hospital admission, if it comes, they cannot afford hospital admissions. And that leads to increase in mortality and in this kind of, in this class of patients. So I think it's something that is what I'm uh, observing or is what I'm uh, uh, studying. Uh, nutrition in cleft is very, very important. Let's know the challenges and let's know how to come, how to overcome them, how to circumvent them. And then also I will, I will also appreciate Smile Train for actually coming this long in treating uh, patients with clefts, uh, I would say worldwide, uh, especially in my own setting here, they have done tremendously well. Apart from the surgery that is free, patients are being fed, are being given BMS, are being given complementary feeding free, though that cannot afford. And those that are from the villages, because most of the patients we have 70% of them are coming from the villages. So some of them don't even know there is something like a smile train uh, treatment or surgical uh, management of cleft patients. But as they go inside the villages, they now search for these patients. These patients are now even given transport money to bring babies to the hospital where the surgery will take place. And it's not just once. Whenever they come, as long as they cannot afford. Now, some of them that are very poor also are being empowered by Smile Train. They have been given some money, and this money helped them in, in doing some petty trading to actually help them to be self reliant. So, I actually appreciate them, uh, Smile Train. They have done very well. They are still doing very well. I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Abdul Salam, for the very informative uh, discussions and also for answering all those questions. Uh, I think uh, this is uh, uh, the end of our last discussion, and I uh, return it back again to the MC, Joseph Minda. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much, Dr. Angun, and thank you very much for Dr. Abdul Salam Mohammed for the amazing closing remarks. But before that, I would like to take a picture so I will take a screenshot of us and the committee member can help me to take a screenshot of the participant today to so everybody who haven't opened their camera please open your camera for photo section okay 
Okay, so I will count and the committee can help me to screenshot it. Okay, one, two, three. Okay, and another one. One, two, three. Thank you very much. So, okay. It was a great opportunity for all of us hearing the valuable knowledge from Dr. Abu Salam Mohammed on this special occasion. In these hard times of the pandemic, the best of another year and tell it. Keep being motivated, pace yourself to learn, and continue completing the courses because we have a lot of amazing speakers coming. My name is Josephina. On behalf of the Faculty of Dentistry Universitas Payajaran and the entire committee, would like to thank Dr. Abu Salam Muhammad as a speaker, Dr. Angun Ravisa as moderator, and to all participants who have joined this live discussion. Thank you so much and goodbye. See you on the next live discussion. Thank you.